Hmm. Uh, more, uh, more uh, somebody be sure of their faith and family and the more they know in Jesus, the least amount of time they want to spend at the graveside. <laughs> and I hear the same thing every time. Well, she or he is not here anyway. And uh, um, I think that really speaks to what Paul wrote about 2,000 years ago. That, that oh, death, where is your sting, oh grave? Where, where is the sting that is supposed to sting so much that I, I've noticed over the years to the very first funeral I did, which was my grandmother's, um, um, that the graveside um, is, still, is still sad as we miss somebody, but it has no sting like it is to do, like I will do for a young man this Sunday who did not know the Lord um, and passed away. The, the grief of the morning, uh, I just wanted to say, you know, let's not ever, not, not that we would forget it, but not realize that by the by the just the great grace that we've been giving given that we sometimes don't even realize um, that we stand here today very very different group of people uh, than people that don't know Jesus and this is evidence of our faith it is people say where's the evidence how do you really know well it is evidence I will tell you um, from standing at, at different gravesides that Jesus is real from the tangibleness that you can see in his presence in people's lives so, though we're not here in the presence of Ethel today, um, and I don't think we need to uh, pretend like some people do to make ourselves feel better, thinking that she's looking down, can I just say, she's not worried about us right now. <laughs> I mean, is that okay to say, she's not looking down at us, she is enjoying herself and what she has longed to see for all of her life. We don't need to tell us of ourselves that to make ourselves feel better. We are like Martin saying, I I'm ready to go when you're ready to take me, Lord, because I want to be with you. So I, I'd like to read just in the, the spirit of that and the, and, the, and the gravesite being different for us today. What, what you know, you as a family told me was her favorite um, verse or favorite psalm was Psalm 51. Um, and um, though, though I think we all think about um, the one particular verse in verse 10, creating me a clean heart. I wanted to read the whole psalm today um, as we stand here. So have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt and purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion and it haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. <laughs> But you desire honesty from the room, womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't let me keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. Do not desire, you do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not offer a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken spirit an unrepentant heart, O oh God. It, it is one of truly one of the, the most beautiful psalms I think that there is. And it's this person, David, who is accepting God's grace and forgiveness following some terrible errors of judgment that he made in his life. But the promise that he was standing on to, that we stand on today, is that God will not reject a broken and repentant heart. Like I said er earlier, we don't sit here and stand here today with hope of Ethel's life because she accomplished some great thing or because of the great person that she was, but simply she had the same hope that David did following this grievous sin that he committed, that God, you don't accept me upon my, my life and my sins, but upon your favor and your forgiveness. She has been received and welcomed today, and we thank, we thank God for that. He has not rejected her, but he is with her. I've heard Martin say a couple times that Ethel was like his mom. And uh, I think about that. You will teach rebels your way. She taught. She taught some rebels her their way, and she 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 acted like mom. But she acted like the heavenly Father, who constantly guides us and cares about us. 
course, God cares about us and when we make mistakes because he wants us to know him and his love and, and never to fall short of that, to knowing that. But I'm just thankful that we're reminded again today that we we stand, we sit, we will be with God based upon his grace. Colossians 1, 27 was one more verse she underlined that I wanted to read here. For God wanted them to know the riches of glory of Christ. Uh, wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing in his glory. And I thought there's no better words really for us to finish with. That the secret to our assurance is Christ who lives in us. Hmm. Paul just... Paul uh, uh, described that in 1 Corinthians 15 that we oftentimes read in these moments. If it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection from the dead? Kind of a, a rumor that was circling in the New Testament church. He said if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ hasn't been raised from the dead. And if Christ hasn't been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses of God who have testified about God raising Christ from the dead. But he, but um, but he did. If he did not raise him, um, but he did not raise him. In fact, from the dead, then the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are a, we are of all people most to be pitied. It's kind of a tongue twister there because he's using a bunch of rhetorical questions that are in answers and no. Well, of course Jesus was risen from the dead. So, of course we have hope for those who have passed on before us. If our hope for Christ was only in this life, he says, then we should be pitied above all people. Because, of course, we know that's not true. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Which is why... We don't um, have the sting at the grave that those that do not understand Christ do. And so I, I just thought I'd finish with this and pray. Um, First Thessalonians, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And I love how he finishes that whole thing. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so I know that we stand here with sadness and grief, but I also want to, as the, as the Apostle Paul said, to encourage you with these words today, that we would actually find the beautiful divine paradox of the grave, that at one moment we're in grief, but in the next moment we're comforted and we're encouraged because we know that, we, that she, like the rest of us, will move on only to what is greater. And not just because heaven is so wonderful, but because we'll be in the presence of our Lord and along with all the rest of us, the way that God had designed it. And so let's, let's pray today. God, I, I thank you for this moment. Lord, that we can be real, that we can share in our grief and in the loss of, of Ethel. And Lord, what we will so dearly miss. You, you made us for relationship, for love. You created marriage. Lord, you know how beautiful it is to live and to be with each other. You said in the beginning, it is not good that this created man, Adam, was alone. And so you divided him up into another being, this woman, so that the two could come together again and be one like he was first created. Lord, you made all of this because you knew, Lord, that we weren't made to be alone, just as you are not alone in this beautiful trinity. And so, God, you, you know that we grieve and you know the loss that we feel because you entered into this existence as your son, Jesus. And you experience, Lord, the pain and the hurt that we're experiencing right now. But God, we don't stay there. As that famous verse in Ephesians says, but God, who is rich in grace and mercy, did not leave us alone in our sins, but raised us up so that we could be seated together in heaven with Jesus. And we thank you today, God, that Ethel is there standing, as we read earlier today, in your glory. You have given her your glory. Lord, the reward, Lord, of all those who put their trust and their hope and their faith in you. 
And so, Lord, we are a little bit jealous, Lord God, that she's getting to experience what we long to experience someday, too. So, God, I thank you that you are the God of all comfort, and I pray you comfort the family that is here, the family that couldn't be here today. Comfort each one of them, the family and friends who will miss mm -hmm. Ethel so dearly. But, Lord, when you do come and you comfort us, may you also encourage us in that moment that we, too, are eagerly awaiting that day. Lord, when all of this goes away and we, we, we finally experience the total fulfillment, the total realization of our faith and seeing you face to face. Lord, seeing our loved ones and those who have gone before us face to face again. And we thank you and we long for that day. But until that day, God, may we never stop. Lord, sharing the gospel, sharing the good news of who you are with all those that are around us. May we never stop and start uh, become weary in doing good. But Lord, may we continue the, the legacy that Ethel and her parents and those that have all gone before us have given us. Lord, that we give our lives to the gospel. We give our lives to the faith in Jesus so that we can bring others along with us to experience such a great salvation. I thank you, Lord, for the life that she lived, the example that she was and is, Lord, to so many of us. And Lord, may we continue to live up not only to her life, but Jesus, as Paul said, to what you have done and died to give us as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This concludes our services today, and you can take a moment here and, um, um, and spend whatever time you need. But there will also be a reception back at our church um, in, in the basement of our church. There's some tables set up and some, some food and um, some things that you can get. You're all welcome to come back and, and enjoy that today. So um, please do that, but take your time as you go. Thank you very much for coming and, and uh, celebrating and honoring Apple's life with us.